Okay, um, I think we're ready to start. It's now 11.02. Um, so, hi, my name is Kaylee Stanley. I'm the Stroke Program Manager, um, and I manage the um, Central Stroke National Audit Program um, here at King's College London, and um, we're going to just present a, uh, just a, a, hopefully a quick webinar about SNAP and the National Data Opt-out today. So a summary of what we will cover today, and hopefully we can get through this content and have enough time for questions, as I know that you probably have a number of things that, that you want to ask. Um, first, we're going to provide an overview of the National Data Opt-Out Policy and general processes. We'll talk a little bit about how the opt-out affects SNAP in particular. Um, we'll also talk about consent and how that relates to the National Data Opt-Out, and finally go through some example scenarios, some flowcharts, and some frequently asked questions based on some things that have already come through the help desk. Okay, next slide. So um, an overview of the national data opt-out. Um, so as of July 31st, um, it's expected that all organizations providing or coordinating publicly funded health or social care in England will be compliant with the national data opt-out policies. So the opt-out allows patients to choose whether they don't want to have their confidential data used for, for further research or planning. Um, so as you may know already, clinical audit does fall under the remit of research and planning, and it's not exempt from the opt-out. So um, HCRIP has been working with the CAG to seek a blanket exemption for all of the national clinical audits, but this is still being discussed and it's really highly unlikely that this will be successful before July, and to be honest, even at all. Um, so from we here at SNAP are working to, you know, get compliant um, ahead of July 31st, and we expect that anyone who is participating in SNAP will also be doing the same. Okay, next slide. So um, the national opt-out policy has implications, obviously, that extend beyond clinical audit. So it is expected that all organizations update their local policies and procedures to comply. So I guess the question is, how do organizations ensure that they're not passing on any patient data for anything other than clinical care? Um, so I guess the short answer would be that they need to set up a system that allows them to check whether a patient is on the national opt-out list. And short of going around to every GP in your area and asking who's opted out, um, there's something called the, the Check for National Data Opt-Out Service, and that's on um, through NHS Digital. So that uses a secure messaging service, which is called Mesh, to allow users to send a data file which contains a list of patient NHS numbers. That service then um, then returns that updated an updated version of that data file with NHS numbers of only those who have not opted out. So it will have removed um, patients who have opted out from that list. So. Um, a lot of you are already familiar with that system, but we do advise that you check with your wider organization to ensure that your trust is um, either already compliant or in the process of becoming compliant, and more importantly, that they have access to MeSH. Um, so according to the NHS Digital website, um, for organizations who have already met GDPR um, requirements, it will take two to three months to become compliant for the national data opt-out. And if you're not already um, compliant with um, GDPR requirements, it could take up to six months. So if you haven't um, started that, or if you know that your organization hasn't started um, becoming compliant, um, you know, it's, it's time to push your organization to to start um, doing what they need to do in order to become compliant for, the, for July 31st. Um, all of this is available um, on the NHSC website, but we also have links in all of our, um, on our support page and in all of our guidance on our, our website. Okay, so what does this mean for SNAP in particular? So um, I just want to emphasize that the role of the SNAP team is to inform participating teams about how the national data opt-out um, applies to SNAP. And it is up to every individual trust to implement their own national data opt-out policy. And we at SNAP have no oversight um, on, of how, on how each trust adheres to the national data opt-out. That's up to um, every trust. However, um, how this affects SNAP. 
is that um, every patient's NHS number must be screened against the national opt-out list prior to any of their data being entered onto the SNAP tool. So when you add a record onto SNAP, um, what you're saying is that that number has been screened, um, all of that patient, the patient's NHS number has been screened against the national opt-out list, and that patient has not opted out. Um, furthermore, the SNAP won't flow any data for patients who have opted out on for linkage to HES or ONS. So we also um, will be checking against that opt-out list um, before we flow any data to NHS Digital for linkage um, to HES and ONS. Um, so what what will you what will be different about SNAP and how will SNAP actually um, help you to comply? So we'll be adding um, additional not notifications on the web tool when you start and when you lock a record just to remind you to check um, that patient against the national opt-out list. Um, we'll also be developing um, a flag on the web tool. We're in the process of doing that. That's not going to come for a little while, but that will indicate whether a patient has provided informed consent further earlier on in the pathway. So that would flag um, to you as a user whether or not you needed to run that patient's NHS ID through the mesh system. OK, next slide. Um, so I just talked about consent um, and um, so now I'll just go over how consent relates to the national data opt out. So um, just want to emphasize that this is that consent is different from the national opt out. And in order to comply with the national data opt out, you don't need to add consent to your internal policies and practices. However, this is um, a statement from the NHS from the National Data Opt-Out um, website. If a patient has agreed to specific use of data after being fully informed, then the National Data Opt-Out does not apply. Each patient, even patients who have registered a National Opt-Out can agree to take part in a specific research project or a clinical trial by giving their explicit consent, and that includes SNAP. So in other words, um, consent does override opt-out. Um, just a few things to note about consent. SNAP consent still is not mandatory. Our Section 251 exemption remains intact, so you can still be entering data without consent, and it is separate from the national opt-out. Secondly, SNAP consent pertains only to the release of patient identifiable information. So therefore, if a patient refuses consent, they can still be added onto SNAP and just have their patient identifiable information wiped out. They can, the only reason that they wouldn't be able to enter, um, be entered if they refuse consent is if they've also opted out. And finally, if a patient has granted consent to any team, other teams don't ever need to ask again. It's just a one-time thing. Okay, next slide. So um, given all of what I've just said, um, this is the process flowchart that summarizes how to enter data onto SNAP correctly and in compliance with the national data opt-out policies. We'll share these, these flowcharts um, on Zendesk and um, after the webinar. Um, so for first admitting teams or teams that are starting a record, it's really straightforward. Basically, you should never enter any data for any patient who has opted out unless they've already consented. So um, in this case, um, basically a patient will be admitted. At that point, you can choose whether or not you want to seek consent. If consent is granted, um, you can add that patient onto SNAP and you don't need to check them against the national opt-out list. If a patient refuses consent or you don't ask, um, you still need to check that patient's ID against, um, against the opt-out list via MESH. If um, it turns out that patient has not opted out, you can add that record onto SNAP. If the patient has opted out, you cannot enter that record onto SNAP. Okay, next going on to non-admitting teams. So um, this is the process for teams that don't start records onto SNAP. So when a record is transferred onto you. Um, so when a patient is transferred to you, you'll check whether or not consent has been granted at a previous team. If consent has been granted, you can continue on with that record. You don't need to worry about checking them against the opt-out list. If the patient wasn't asked at a prior team, at that point, you can ask the patient for consent. If the consent is given, continue on with that record. Again, don't check. You don't need to worry about checking them against the opt-out list. 
if a patient refuses consent or you don't check, um, you still need to check them against, um, against MeSH. If the patient has not opted out, you can um, continue on with that record and transfer it on. If the patient has opted out, you'll need to revoke that record to the previous team. So I guess this is a little bit more complicated than the first situation where you're starting a record, but um, I think the big takeaways are that you should only be asking patients for consent if they haven't already been asked. And secondly, um, it's important to know who the teams are that usually transfer records to you so that um, if you find out a patient has been opted out and has opted out and you need to revoke the record back, you know, they understand why it is that you're that you're revoking records back. OK. So um, just a few example scenarios. What if um, we've gotten um, a few, we've gotten a lot of questions into the help desk and these are just some that we thought that we'd like to, to point out to you. So in the first instance, um, someone wrote in and said, my stroke unit has registered on SNAP as two different units, as has you and an SU, but it's only for the purposes of data entry as their one organization. Um, they want to know if they need to check the opt-out list when they transfer a SNAP record from the has you to the SU. So in other words, does, it has, does this SU actually need to check um, the, the record before they continue on with the um, with entering data. And the answer is no, because the um, if you're one organization, you only need to check one time um, because that data is never and that patient data is never actually leaving your organization. So um, that so the stroke unit doesn't need to to check the record before they continue answer um, entering data um, if they receive the record from within their or own organization. Um, the next question or the next situation is um, local practice is to enter all patients on SNAP before checking against the opt-out list. Before locking, we check against the list and then we request to delete all of those patients who have, who have opted out. Is this best practice? So as I mentioned before in the flow chart and then early on in, the, um, in this webinar, um, I mentioned that all patients do need to check be checked um, via MeSH um, to see whether or not they've opted out before you even start um, a record. And so therefore this isn't best practice. Um, when, you, when you start a record, even if you haven't locked the record, that data is stored on the database. So it is considered data flow. Um, so you shouldn't ever be end, even starting a record um, for a patient who um, whose opt out status is unknown. Um, okay. And the next situation, if my team screens a patient against the opt-out list and they aren't opted out, can we include them even if they have also refused consent? Um, the answer is yes, you can. So if a patient has refused consent but is not on the opt-out list, it works just the way it does now pre-opt-out. Um, and you can enter their information onto the web tool. When you get to section three, the question about um, consent in section three or section seven, you check no. At that point, all the identifiable information is wiped from the record and you can continue entering data. Um, and finally, um, we're a community rehab team and we just received a record from an acute team. When we checked against the national data opt-out list, this patient has opted out. So do we delete the record altogether? So referring back to the flowchart that I just showed, um, if you receive a record and you find that the patient has opted out, you have to assume that the record was started and that the previous team actually checked um, to make sure that the patient wasn't op had not opted out. So you have to assume that the patient opted out or, or appeared on the opt-out list in between when the record was, um, the patient was discharged and the record was transferred to you. Um, so you should be just revoking that record. If that's happening a lot and you notice that's happening a lot from, you know, from in their specific, there are a lot of records coming to you um, from a particular organization that shouldn't be coming to you, um, we suggest that you work with the team that's transferring those records. Okay, so um, some other frequently asked questions. Um, so how will this, um, how will the national data opt out affect expected cases or case ascertainment? So as of September, about 5% um, of patients have opted out 
but we that's nationally but we recognize it really can vary from place to place and regionally and so we'll continue to keep this under review if you're finding that there are high rates of opt-out at your team and that that's a affecting your your team's ability to meet expected the expected cases threshold um we suggest you get in touch with the help desk and we can adjust your cases um on a case by case basis um <clears throat> similarly to that um the how will we be adjusting what will we be adjusting audit compliance scoring to account for the extra time that this process will add to data entry um the answer is not at the moment um so at the moment you need to in order to get 100 percent on audit compliance you need to lock a record within seven days so we won't be changing that for now but we will definitely be keeping that under review um I, we're you know, we're not sure how it will actually work in practice and it could affect certain teams more than others, especially if you're paper based. <clears throat> um, and finally, how does this affect non admitting providers who don't start records? In other words, do non admitting providers still need to check against the, um, the opt out list? And the answer is, yeah, you do, um, as as we've I've shown um, earlier. So non-admitting providers will still need to check against opt-out lists, um, but only for patients who haven't consented earlier on in the pathway. Okay, so some key takeaways and um, next steps. So I just want to reiterate, now is the time to confirm with your wider organizations um, that they're compliant and um, that they also have access to MeSH. So this should be really straightforward for all of those providers who are who sit within an NHS setting. But if you are a provider outside of the NHS network, getting access to MeSH will be more challenging. So um, I suggest you, you, you start soon. Um, I can say personally because um, you know SNAP has to have access access to MeSH, but we're not within the NHS. You know, it's, it's, it's quite challenging. Um, you also need to ensure that your data entry practices are up to date and um, account for the opt out processes and opt out policies. So um, this is something that your team will need to decide on internally. For example, whether or not you want to add consent to your processes and if so, at what point in the patient's stay. And um, I know there are a lot of different kinds of teams with different kinds of um, SNAP data entry processes. So, you know, you'll have to tailor your processes to how to, you know, to how you currently work. Um, we'd love for you to share um, what you're doing so that we can support you as best we can. And we'd also encourage you to feed back to us about how your team is affected by the opt out, the rate of opt out and how that's adding to your data entry burden. Um, as I said before, HCRIP is still seeking an exemption for um, <clears throat> for like for all clinical audits and it could be that SNAP has to seek their own exemption. So any information about how this is affecting teams on the ground would be really, really important to us. Um, and finally, SNAP's, um, what will we continue to do? We'll continue to update our guidance, our web tool, we'll continue to host user groups and hopefully facilitate shared learning. So whatever comes in to us, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to share with all of you um, to encourage best practice. Um, and that's all for um, my portion, um, but if you, I'll open it up to questions now. And you can send questions in the chat and um, then Noel or Ellie will um, read them out. Hi everyone, I'm Noel, one of the SNAP project officers. And yes, we're going to have the Q&A session now. So if you would like to send any question, there is this dialog bubble icon with a question mark that says Q&A so you can submit it through it. And we have a first question asking if the presentation will be shared. And the answer is yes. We are going to send the recording and the slideshow to attendees and also to any other colleagues that you think might find it useful. So yes, then someone was asking if there would be a consent form and yes in the slideshow we have included a link to some snap uh, consent forms and also a patient leaflet with information about snap so you can 
you can pick it from there and share it to to your patients and you can contact also our help desk if you cannot find it and we can send you the forms then we have I think this one may be for Kaylee. Why will non-admitting teams need to worry about this? And we're saying that the responsibility lies within the admitting team to gain consent. I think you have mentioned about non-admitting teams on one of your slides. Yeah, so not in, I, I, I understand. Um, I understand why where this question comes from because I had the same question um, when they introduced this policy. So um, we can't just assume. So as per um, all the guidance from NHSD, we can't assume that a patient's one that that a patient um, a patient's opt out status is static. We have to assume that it can change further on. So if you're a non-admitting team and you're getting um, and you're receiving a record, um, you have to assume that it's possible that the patient could have opted out in between having seen provider A and you. Um, I know that that seems, you know, implausible in some instances, but that is what you, you do need to assume as per the guidance from NHS Digital. OK, then we have two questions a bit similar about consent previously given to a previous team and on the pro forma it will be flagged on section three or section seven. There is a consent question and there you can see if the previous team has already replied yes. So you will already know that the patient previously consented to to snap. We have also another one for Kaylee from an admitting team. They say they have checked and the patient has opted out on mesh. Can we then ask consent and ask and add the patient on the pathway without leaving identifiable information? Yep, that is absolutely possible. So if a patient had, you know, I, I think that that's up to, up to you in terms of how you want to how you want to do that. So in my flow charts, I say, you know, um, we recommend that you ask cons that consent is asked before you know opt out status. But I mean, it is possible. I know that some teams are doing it slightly differently. So if you find out that a patient has opted out, you can then ask them if they want to be um, included on SNAP and that would just override. Um, their opt-out. Okay, and also maybe for you, Kaylee, they ask if we could clarify, should a record be checked for opt-out twice before starting the record on SNAP and before logging to discharge? I think that it's, um, you know, I think it's fairly fair to say that, you know, um, that the patient probably hasn't gone to their GP between the time that they were admitted to your hospital and um, organization and then um, discharge. But, you know, in some cases, I suppose it's possible, especially in the community. But um, I think um, you just by checking before you add um, is, is, is sufficient for sure. So there is also another one. If the SNAP record could be updated, have a tick box to indicate consent has been asked or checked against mesh. So just to clarify, consent is SNAP consent and mesh is the NHS opt out. So on the record, you can see if the patient has given SNAP consent, but regarding mesh that's uh, managed by NHS and the new team should check the record against the opt out unless you see that the previous team has already indicated on section three or seven that the patient gave consent. So again, once you receive a record, maybe the first thing you could do is go to section three or seven and check if the patient has already given consent and then move on from there. We have one about the opt out going live later than expected. So yes, it has been moved from the 31st of March to the 31st of 
July now, and in the NHS email, it was mentioned that this was the last time they were delaying it, so supposedly it will go on the 31st of July. Just seeing um, um, a couple of questions that have just recently come through. So someone's asked whether or not the um, it's only through the GP that the patient um, can register an opt out, and that is true. Um, it's only through a GP that a patient can register an opt out. Um, and um, you'll know that consent has been given early on in the journey. I know, Noelle, you, you touched on that, but um, it should be checked. You can check in the patient record, whether it's been checked in Section 3 or 7, um, 3, um, whether or not they've they've um they've provided consent and we're currently working um, with our web developer to just um, to make that a little bit easier for you um, to just have like a little flag um, that so something on the record that just um, follows the record through like in every section um, that just indicates that the patient has consented. Yes, and maybe for you Kelly, I think you talk a bit what happens when a record is revoked. Does the team now getting the record back need to delete it? No, so the team doesn't need to delete it. It's just no data can be entered further. Because the way that the the data opt out works is it's just um, it's prospective, so it doesn't um, it doesn't apply to any retrospective data. So it's from the time of opt out. So if a patient has opted out after you've seen them, you don't need to, you know, you you don't need to um, to delete any of the data we already have. Okay, then someone was asking about consent being gathered in a paper version or in a note for the hospital electronic system. And again, I think you could you could do both. You you can record it on your local system and Snap also has a consent form that you can print and get consent with the patient's signature, of course, if, if the patient is able to sign it. But yeah, it's up to, to each trust how they would like to record consent. We have one saying, if someone consents on initial assessment, can we add regardless of data opt out? Yeah, so if um, a patient has provided consent um, at initial assessment, yes, you can add regardless of opt out. You don't need to worry about even checking them against the opt out list. And um, just to clarify, yes, consent is in the consent form and, and we'll send around the links to all of our consent materials. Um, you do, since consent um, applies to patient identifiable information, you that's something that you have to explicitly ask. Is if um, the patient wants, is okay with their patient identifiable information, that's NHS number, name, um, date of birth, um, added to SNAP. Okay, and we have a question, an interesting question from a rehab community perspective. How will they know that someone is not on SNAP as a result of opting out and not just because they haven't been added at the acute stage that they say sometimes happens? Maybe uh, I guess they could they could try to double check it with the acute site, contacting them why that patient is missing and to make sure if it's because the patient opted out or just because the acute site still could then create the record. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that that's not something that you could ever see in the web tool because their data can't be can't be added to the web tool. So, um, yeah, that's something that I think, um, yeah, you'll have you'll have to work with 
teams that are transferring records to you to understand. I mean, um, we don't know, we won't know the opt out rate. Um, it's not something that we can publish in our reports, unfortunately, um, but we can hopefully try to share, you know, what's going on. Um, and we encourage you to share what's going on, you know, when in terms of opt out rates with any teams that you that you normally transfer records to. So they know what to expect. OK, and we have one Kaylee that says if the patient shares national data opt in. So I understand it as coming back as not opt out. Does the patient still need to be consented for SNAP? No, they don't need to be consented for SNAP, but um, I, I think that you have to see consent as and opt out as two separate things and uh, and consent happens to override opt out. Um, you know, we always encourage that, you know, you try to see consent if and when you, you're able to. Um, and so especially at, at six months, um, but yeah, I mean, if you choose not to ask someone who's opted in or not opted out um, for consent, that that's totally fine. OK, thank you, Kaylee. And we have another one maybe for you asking a bit. If the SNAP results will be inaccurated or affected by the opt out. I don't think that we'll know um, the extent to which SNAP results are affected by opt out and, and whether or not that's, you know, certain areas are, are more affected until um, it becomes mandatory. Um, but any sort of um, feedback from teams about what's happening um, to your to, in terms of case ascertainment um, will be really, really helpful um, ahead of July if you've started um, implementing the process. I see also someone's asked um, how long it takes to screen patients against the opt out. So um, on the NHSD website, I mean, I think that there are several ways in which to, you can um, access mesh and, and send the these um, these numbers through um, and I think it's something around like 30 minutes to a couple of hours um, that in terms of turnaround time I don't know um, you know so I think that this is something that you know you, we just have to verify with teams once they start doing it okay and we have one saying our audit team complete new acute admissions and also the data for our community teams. If we check the mesh when we start entering the community data, do we need to check again when we go back to do the six month review? It's oh, a good question. Um, you're the, and it's the same organization? Yeah, I think maybe it will, it will get back to if it's the same trust. Yeah. If it's the same trust. You were talking about if it's always the same trust yeah. doing. Oh, that's it. Well, I mean, at six months, you should be asking for consent anyway. Um, so, you know, I hopefully you won't have to worry about checking because you'll have get, gotten consent from them. Um, but yeah, I that, that that does sit in a gray area and I'm hesitant to give a definitive answer there because it is possible that in that time that patient could have gone to their GP and opted out. Um, but I think that that emphasis, you know, in terms of, of, of consent, I mean, we all we encourage um, you to be getting consent from all patients at the six month mark. Um, and so, you know, hopefully that won't be an issue because you'll have consent from patients. OK, and we have one asking, is this for patients from the 31st of July or do we have to check current patients? You can start checking current patients um, ahead of the 31st of July, but it's only mandatory from the 31st of July. And someone is asking if the patient does not have an NHS number, how do we carry out compliance with national opt-out? Um, then, then, then you cannot. 
it, it, um, it, yeah. it wouldn't apply to them, yeah. It, it won't be on, on the list. Yeah. So we have, again, some people asking about consent being recorded by previous teams. So I will quickly take a look to the consent question if you want to make a note on section 3 is question 3.9 so you can check that question to see what's recorded there and then there is also on section 7 7.14 and i think also kaylee mentioned the possibility of including a flag on on the online system so yes i think maybe you you could go to question 3.9 or on section 7 to double check if it's there and we could also explore this possibility of including a note on the online record we have one about also consent saying if we get consent that our rights the opt out do we need to explicitly ask whether they want patient identifiable information to be added or not? Yes, um, and that's part of the consent materials that we have on um, our site. And I think that you know what we'll do is we'll we'll send all of that information out along with um, the webinar slides um, so that everyone has access to you know some some sample you know consent information. OK, and there is one saying if the previous team has ticked the box to say they have given consent, can the next team take this consent to continue or do we need to ask again if they have opted out? Okay. So I, I think the second team will be checking the patient and maybe maybe finding the patient has opted out, but at the same time, seeing on the record that it has given consent to the previous team so i think if, if they already have given consent then that's okay even if the second team is seeing that the record is on the opt-out for that patient if consent is recorded then that's okay you can take that consent Um, so I've just noticed that there are some questions and in, 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 um, about consent, assuming that consent is mandatory. And I just really want to reiterate, and I'm sorry if this wasn't clear earlier, but I, because I know a lot of the, the um, discussion um, post web has really been around consent. I want to reiterate that consent is still not mandatory. It will never will never be mandatory for SNAP. It's just a convenient way, you know, I think to get around the national data opt out, um, you know, you you don't need to add consent at all to the to your data entry or collection processes in any way whatsoever. You can just stick to national data opt out and just take consent out of the mix altogether unless you're a six month provider. But um, yeah, um, consent is not mandatory at all. So, and especially, you know, and, and the reason that we have the Section 251 exemption is because it's not appropriate. We it, we understand it's not appropriate necessarily to ask for consent at that acute stage, you know, when a patient is first admitted. I know that I've seen, I see someone just wrote in that gaining consent from very sick stroke patients is very difficult. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why we have the Section 251 in place, um, which which eliminates the need for consent. So, um, you know, it's totally understandable if you can't get consent, it's just another option um, that, you know, it, it does override national data opt-out. I hope that that was clear. There is a question in the case that the patient isn't available on the opt-out list and the patient is not able to consent neither what should they do 
if they're not available on the opt out list well if they're not if they're if they're coming through if there's no way that you know like maybe they don't have an nhs number and you can't get consent you would treat it you know as you would now um there's no you know that they're, they're not you can put them on snap yeah yeah have a question what about creating records prior to transferring patients to another center for thrombectomy um, um, yeah i mean it is it is assumed that you before you create those records that you that you do check um against the national opt-out list yeah yes yeah yeah it should be checked before creating the record on snap. Um, someone is asking how to access to mesh. So yes, if you don't, if you couldn't get any link to mesh, you you can contact us on the help desk, and we have some links to NHS Digital where they explain how to set up everything at your local trust. I can also um, I can I can send around a um, a link right now to the national opt out service getting set up for that. So I'll, I'll send that right now. OK, and they are also asking if they can continue to update patients on SNAP at present, but have to check from the 31st of July only. Yep. Um, if that if that if that's how how you want to prepare, that that's absolutely absolutely fine. Yeah, we are also getting a lot of questions about timings in terms of how long it could take to get the list back from Mesh and how it could affect snap and if we could make any considerations and i i think it's you already mentioned that nhs said uh, around an hour but yeah we we will really know once this goes live and every team is using it not only at snap but in any other audit so yeah i think we can keep monitoring it so if you see that at your local site Mesh is taking like a really long time to give you back the list. Then you can get in touch with us and, and we can monitor how. How how to to deal with it. OK, um, I think now we'll, we'll take one more question and then um, we'll We'll end the webinar like a bit early, um, and you know any other questions that we haven't um, addressed is possibly because they're they're a little complicated, and we'll um, send we'll address them via email. Um, okay. Yes. Maybe we can take this one. If the patient's record has been started before the 31st of July, but is still an inpatient after July the 31st, does this mandatory opt-out apply to them? Or only for records to be started after the 30, 31st? I think um, in this case, um, only for records started after July 31st. Um, and then, I mean, whatever, when that record is transferred to the next team, the next team will check against the opt is it, it, It's mandatory that they check against the opt out list. But if the record has been started, you know, you, you can, you know, um, before the 31st it's going to be only probably a handful of records but and i know we'll probably get a lot of questions into the help desk then but i think that you can um you can you know go about business as usual on the 30 30th and then you know after that um when it's mandatory yeah 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 i think yeah that's fine we have we really had a lot of participation and engagement in the q a there are some more questions that we couldn't take in terms of time, but we are going to check them and maybe we could collate and create a Q&A file 
with those questions that will be useful for every user. So we can also send it with a recording and the slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I think a lot of um, questions that you've asked are really, you know, all of these are useful and we'll be adding a lot of these questions to our frequently asked questions um, on um, Zendesk. So, um, you know, keep an eye out for that as well. OK, so anything that, you know, it will we'll, um, reply to dip to everybody um, separately via email. If there are slightly more um, complicated questions, we'll, like um, Noel said, we'll publish the um, webinar slides as well as the recording. And um, we'll also send around a document and um, update our Zendesk um, to address all of these um, questions and concerns that you have. And um, feel free to email into um, the help desk if you have anything else that um, you know that that you have questions about. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, and um, have a wonderful afternoon. Bye.